making them believe that we supply enemies. <laughs> well, uh, I'm uh, Tim Kassen, uh, of the Love IQ, and the topic in here, please waste my time. Uh, I'm a red teamer, I lead a team of pen testers at a small consulting firm, Blue Bastion Security, which is blue teaming and red teaming. Uh, and, and because we do blue and red, I have had some change of heart over the years, and I've changed my mind quite a bit on, on some issues because I'm starting to see the pain that looting was. Uh, now that I'm not just handing over the pen test report and disappearing for one year, and coming back, we use the same vulnerabilities, I'm starting to see some of the issues that the blue team runs into, but is being one of them. People not changing the passwords. We had an incident response where the sysadmin, one of the sysadmins at that very large organization, just forgot to change his password after an incident. And, and he was responsible for issuing password resets for everybody during a ransomware incident and for just forgot to change the password. So that kind of stuff happens. Um, and uh, we come in and do our pen testing, and I got really excited this one time because I bought a Windows Server 2003 box on an external network, and it was vulnerable to MS 0867. It was vulnerable to Eternal Blue, and I got <laughs> excited. And I walked to call the client saying, "Hey, I really want to pull this, but I think a, a better thing to do would be to just tell you to bring it down right now." And they go, "No, we don't have a Windows Server 2003 box." We don't have one open for the world either. What's going on? Are you sure you have the right school? I call Corey, my VP at Blue Team, and he starts laughing at me. Because, well, that was one of our honey bots that you ran into. So, dude, you should have told me that yesterday. I spent eight, eight, eight hours on this. So, eight hours basically on that. So, that's what we want to talk about today. Um, so, before we um, start getting into it, what, why? Why do we care for this? Well, there's a few ways to look at this. One, quite often like here, we don't have the budget for the for the SIN. We don't have the budget for a security team. Uh, we don't have time to put in those controls. And maybe, I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, but maybe you start with some honeypots. Okay. Or you've got money, you are a very mature organization, you've spent all this time putting in these controls, the, the best idiot out there, um, you are no longer using Norton. Yeah. Maybe you are. I shouldn't judge. Um, and uh, I just lost my dream of here. That's what I thought. <laughs> so, so you've got the best and the brightest and the, the most amount of money you could spend. And now you're just sitting in there and just dealing with the alerts all day long. And even then, it may be a good idea to put in a honeypot because depending on your threat actors, there may be a mission state in there. And no matter how much money you spend on an ADR, as just a mediocre red team or myself, I can tell you, there are still ways to get around those. And you are just starting to give us a lot of pain at the same time, still this cat and mouse game. Uh, another bad, good, good, bad advice, if you are just learning cybersecurity, you are wanting to be a blue teamer, or you want to be a red teamer, and you want to play with some real threat data, maybe spin up a honeypot in AWS, in Azure, Lino, somewhere, just not at home. Just don't do that at home. Okay? I had a friend tell me this morning that uh, he's so fed up with Google that he wants to spin up his own email server. Please don't do that. <laughs> Please do not spin up your own email server. Anyway, so, uh, why, why waste my time? Well, you should waste my time because there will be a compromise at some point. No matter who you are, no matter how secure you are, no matter what zero trust you've got. Okay? Even if you have sneaker nets where you have to physically walk a file from one computer to another, that is still not zero trust. You are trusting the person who's walking that file from one computer to another. And another thing to think about, especially, you know, focusing on Windows in here, because that's one of my data expertise, and two is most common in corporate environments. There are things in corporate environments, specifically Windows Active Directory, that make it more likely 
that you are having a hard time protecting the environment. And makes it more likely that the red teamers <laughs> myself are having a lot of fun. And I call them feature or vulnerability because sometimes we don't really know if it's a feature or if it's not. One of them, the most common one, is broadcast multi-gasoline resolution protocols. Okay? So in, in colleges, we're taught, in schools, we're taught, you want to know what Google.com is, you go to the domain name server. End of story. That's not true. If you pull up one shot in an end enterprise environment, you will likely see NetBIOS name service, MDMS, LLMNR, those three protocols. They are broadcast and multicast name resolution, meaning I'm asking everybody in the neighborhood, hey, do you know where this host is? The crazy part in Windows, it's not just that I'm asking everybody in this network, I'm asking everybody in every single network I have an adapter connected to. If you're a VPN, and maybe traversing over a VPN too. Okay. So uh, in, what happens with this is, we go into network environments, um, we do our pen test, we spin up this tool called Responder. We, it, it, it's so common that we joke about it as if it's the most basic thing you'll do in a pen test. Reality is, it is the most effective thing you end up doing. So your computer is asking the domain name server, hey, do you know what HR share is? At the same time, it's asking everybody in the network. When you respond to that, and we say, hey, we are the HR share you're looking for. It doesn't matter if the user mistyped it or the type it right. The computer is still doing that name resolution. So you've got a responder on the right side, and we get what is called a net NTLM hash for that user, which can then be relayed or cracked. Um, we were cracking that in the class yesterday. I think it was about uh, nine mega hashes per second in a, on a CPU in a VM. That's about nine million guesses per second. In a virtual machine with a CPU. That's pretty crazy. So good luck with the uh, in for fasteners there. Another issue that makes it difficult to do the, the uh, detection response and to protect your environments is how easy it is to spill those hashes. Tracking pixels and emails can spill your hashes. And you are pretty much used to marketing teams using tracking pixels. Uh, you open the email, the tracking pixel is loaded from the marketing team's website, and that's how they know that you open the email. <laughs> well, what if you use the UNC path, the slash slash in the beginning, as the UNC path, like going to a Windows file share? You do that, whoever opens that email, their, uh, in, in our desktop, their hash gets sent over to whoever uh, is running the IP address. I use this against the client. It was taking too long to get in anywhere. They were really good at what they were doing. And they had asked me, do whatever you want to get some access. So I said, hey, here's my daily status email on the pen test. We have not done anything. So, you know, maybe the report will be empty. And in that email was a traffic fix off. And I got my point of context credentials this way. So you get those hashes, and then instead of having to crack them, if your environment does not have SMB signing required, does not require digital signatures, which is default in Windows, you can just relay those hashes. So I can take that net NTLM hash from one box and walk over to another and say, hey, I'm Boston, here's my hash, let's log in. You can do this cross protocol to LDAP, to Active Directory Certificate Services, uh, Windows Server 2016, the main controllers, uh, and later require SMB signing now. Uh, Windows 11 will start requiring it in a future version. It's not mandatory just yet. Uh, but hey, they tried to disable SMB v1 a long ago, right? That's still in all the corners, so we'll probably still see that. So we got broadcast protocols, spewing hashes. We got the ability to pull hashes because we have um, anytime you go to a UNC path, we spill hashes. Uh, we can just take those hashes, we can walk over to anybody else in the network who does not require us to be signing, and we can sign in as whoever's hash we stole. This has become such an easy path to DA that we really just pipeline it in the beginning of a pen test. I have responder running that is responding to broadcast multicast protocol. 
uh, to name resolution requests that I have NTL and RelayX running, this partner gets those hashes, NTL and RelayX relays them. Another issue that is pretty common for escalation in Windows environments, Kerberos then. Kerberos has two tickets. There's two ticket types that are used for authentication. Uh, you go to the domain controller when you log into your computer in the morning. The computer goes to the domain controller for the KDC service running on it and says, hey, I'm custom. Uh, here is the response to your challenge, which is really just encrypting a timestamp with your hash. Can you please give me an authentication ticket? That is your, your TGT, ticket running ticket. That is the badge you got when you came to the conference this morning. Then you went to some villages. Some of you went to trainings yesterday. That required an additional interaction. That is your service ticket. So you show your badge and you go, hey, I'm authorized to be here, but I also want one more service. It's like going to a uh, county or state fair. You have an admission ticket to enter that county or state fair. That is your ticket granting ticket. And then you need another ticket for Ferris wheel. Uh, which I was surprised Casey has a Ferris wheel in the middle of a parking lot. It's keeping crazy. Uh, it's a uh, <laughs> so you got the, um, you, you hand over the, uh, the TGT, your admission ticket, and you say, hey, can I have a ticket for a Ferris wheel? Can I have a ticket for another ride? That is your service ticket, TGS. Well, the TGS is encrypted with the service accounts and hash. So what we do, any domain user in the environment can go to the domain controller and say, hey, give me service tickets for every single service account. That is, you're authenticating for that service account. Doesn't necessarily mean you're authorized to access the service, but you do get the service ticket that you can use and interact with it. That is encrypted with service accounts hash, and we take it offline and we start tracking it. Um, that one in a CPU, we got about, uh, I think it was five or six mega hashes per second, something like that. Um, still, still pretty fast to crack. Oftentimes, service accounts are using bad passwords. How, how often do you see them as domain admins? Service accounts given domain admin privileges. Me as a red teamer, I love that. It makes my job so much easier. Uh, but defenders, it's a lot more difficult. So, cover roasting, another thing that we do in Red TV that is possible and makes it difficult for you to protect the environments. And what activity we perform in Red Teams uh, and Venom Test? Excuse me, pass the hash. So, I take a hash, an NT or an LM hash, from a device, and instead of cracking it, I walk over to anybody in the network and say, hey, I'm passing, here's my hash. Um, this method is pretty common. Microsoft's patch to this was you cannot do a pass the hash attack against an account that is either not a new account. Well, sorry, let me rephrase it. You can do pass the hash against a local admin or any domain user. You are allowed to do after the Microsoft patch. Pass the hash attacks against local admins and domain users. So who the heck is left? Who, who am I not able to do this against? Non-privileged local users. Well, I don't really care for them anyway. So pass the hash is a pretty common activity. Uh, then pass the ticket. When you are using Kerberos to perform authentication, which is the future now in Windows, you're going to start seeing more and more Kerberos, those tickets are stored locally on your bots. These are the TGTs, the confronting ticket. Uh, and then the ticket running ticket that you walk, you hand over to the domain controller to get TGS, the confronting service ticket. They're both stored in memory. So if you have local admin, you can dump them. Not only can you dump these tickets, you can then take these tickets to other boxes and say, hey, here's my ticket. That's the time get. That is called pass the ticket attack. And we use that quite often in our environments. Another common issue we see in Windows environments is the improper active directory privileges. So this is through a tool called Bloodhound. I would highly suggest checking out Bloodhound. Really good tool for identifying weird messaging. 
So we were performing a pen test against a client's environment, and we saw that all domain users, the group domain users, was allowed to modify the group policy applied to domain controllers. So the main users group was given the right privileges to default domain controllers group policy. So any domain user could just modify the policy in domain controllers and just launch a script, do whatever you want. What happened, we'll see, domain users or one weird user somewhere is given local admin on a box. But nobody knows how that happens. So Bloodhound can help you find that. Um, we'll also find things like users given right privileges to shares. We exploited that in the class yesterday. You can drop an MLK file to start spilling hashes. Uh, you can drop malware in there. You know, you drop a file there called uh, uh, clinical 370s.pdf. A lot of people will open that. So in this case, for example, the service account has generic right on Thanos, who's a member of the main admins. So this account also has SQL admin on pair of SQL box. So, so this account also happens to have service principal name set, making it server hostable. So quite easy path to escalation, quite up under the main admin that we're exploiting, uh, making it difficult to perform detection response to perform security controls. And this is my most and least favorite at the same time. Okay. Uh, passwords, patient data in network shares. Why not find that? Uh, my favorite was KeyPass database, which is a password manager. It's database stored on the IT share, which is not necessarily a bad thing. You need to be an IT user, IT <coughs> member to access it. But it wasn't just that it was KeyPass database. KeyPass database's password, the encryption key, was stored in a TXT file right next to it. And KeyPass installer was also stored there. So the only thing you need to access it was right there. Another William was one we saw a while back was in a hospital where um, the electronic medical record data was being copied over to a network share for the past 10 years. So we had about 13 billion patient records. So, um, and it was an NFS share, so nobody knew it existed. And it was open to everybody else in the environment. And this organization had about 10,000 users. It was pretty big. Just running the LS command in that network share just took a whole day. It was 30 billion vision record. It was like a billion uh, files in there. So quite often we are seeing uh, this kind of stuff where credentials are stored Sensitive data is stored in text files, in PDF files, XLS files. And, and it is making my job quite easy. Let's grab that and start using it. Now, one more thing I want you to note about all of this, everything I went through. Not only is it making my job easy, I'm getting used to doing this. And that's what you're going to exploit. I'm used to seeing passwords in a text file. I'm used to seeing the bad permissions, tickets laying around, hashes laying around in memory. I'm used to seeing Kerber Roastable accounts, broadcast, multicast, name resolution requests, all of this. I'm used to seeing that. So this then leads us to how do you waste my time? What are the things that you can do to cause that waste of time for me? My favorite one in this would be, well, I'm going to say that, but I've seen a slide again, so get used to that. Uh, honey users. Create a user that is a real user. Don't create a fake user. Create a real user. Make a real. Have the user log on to some devices periodically. Okay. Have the user create some network activity. Give it a password that is not too easy, but also is not too difficult. Somebody will likely guess it. Um, and I would also suggest if you are doing things like changing, requiring password changes for your users every 90 days, but stop doing that, please. Make it once a year, make your passwords 16 characters long, don't require complexity. You're going to make my job extremely difficult. Good tangent 16 character passwords are extremely difficult to grab or guess. By the time they get to guessing that one of those passwords, 
you've already seen a million requests from you. You've already detected me. And your users, if you let them choose a password that they will remember and does not require having to use uppercase, lowercase, special characters, numbers, uh, and, a, and you know, your, your firstborn son and whatnot, um, it's going to make it, the password change also easier for you. Help desk is going to have less calls coming from it. So, give it a password that's not too difficult, but not too easy. Have a single password as often as other users do. Um, and then, watch the event viewer on the main controller for any authentications for that user. Uh, if I land Bloodhound, which Bloodhound will pull in all the user data, computer data, root policies, to see which are the different paths I can take to escalate, I'm going to pull that user too. Okay. And if you find that to be too much, if that generates too much traffic, then maybe you do it. Focus on was this user information requested. Maybe you focus on a specific property of that user. Okay. There are some properties for uh, AD objects that are not commonly pulled by your typical tools. Use one of those. And one of the uh, bonus things you can do is you could have a scheduled task running on a uh, Windows, uh, on a domain joint Windows device <laughs> that has this user access a file share, that has this user maybe RDP to a different device. Uh, in a file share, you could simply just do a scheduled task. In a scheduled task, you can do explorer.exe and then the path to the file, file share. And this user periodically then does that activity, which will be seen by the attacker in the network. Uh, don't do it every minute, that's kind of crazy and will be pretty easily caught by us. But do it maybe once a day, like 9 a.m. This person's first thing to do is they open up a file share. Um, the moment somebody requests that user, you know there's somebody malicious because nobody should be talking to this user. Uh, honey, service, uh, service principal names. So this would be your service accounts. So earlier I mentioned the Kerberos thing, where if you have a, any account that has a service principal name set, meaning it's a service account, any domain user can request its service ticket. And we can then crack that ticket offline. Once I have requested that ticket, it's a very quick process, a single request. Uh, the, well, sort of single request. Um, it, 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 I think it's about three requests in total. But once I pull that service ticket from the domain controller, I can just go home with that ticket. Wait for it to crack over the next month, two months, three months. How often are we changing service account passwords? Quite often, they never get changed. I may even have a whole year to crack that ticket and then come back and become that service account. <laughs> so what if you had an account that was a honeypot service account? A honeypot user with a service principal name set. And the moment somebody requests a ticket for that account, <laughs> we know there's somebody malicious. Otherwise, there's no reason for anybody else in the network to talk to you. The event ID for that is going to be 4769. You want to filter on failure code 00. Um, basically, uh, failure code 00 would mean the request was successful. The risk ticket was a okay. You could also um, do this over a scheduled task or an domain door. If you want to be really mean, which I would suggest being mean, make this service account member of the main address. Okay, now that is a very dangerous thing to do. So you're gonna have to monitor it very closely. Make it a member of the name admins and make the password very long and difficult. So it takes me a week to crack it, but I'm gonna spend that time because it's a domain admin. Then, and this is a guesstimate, I have read this somewhere, uh, it was by Nickel Mittel, he runs the Alper Security uh, training team. Um, he mentions in one of his blog posts that you can have domain admins that are not allowed to log on in there. So you, you have a domain admin account and you say log on deny to everything. So even though this simplest principal name is a domain admin, I can't do it. <laughs> My ability to do things with it will be very limited. At the same time, make the password difficult so you waste my whole week just scrapping that patch.
Yeah. Uh, can anybody realize what I'm doing with the pictures in here? Anybody realize what, what's that from? Miss Minutes, yeah. <laughs> Some weird working on Miss Minutes, yeah, that's true. Oh, so earlier I talked about broadcast multicast name resolution. Your computer, instead of just asking the domain name server, hey, do you know where this host is, is asking everyone in the network. So what if you had an actual neighbor resolution request going in the network, but it was a tiny pot request? Nobody should know where FS01 is. Nobody should know where HR01 is. But somebody responded and said, hey, I am HR01. Well, you just caught somebody running responder in your network. And you can do that with a scheduled task running the uh, resolve-dns name command in PowerShell. There are a few caveats to this. If you have already done the work of disabling broadcast multicast room resolution protocols in your network, you're going to have to enable that on the device where you run this command. Actually, you could do this on the Linux box. And so if you do PowerShell, you could do something else to do this. But coming from Windows box, it will look much more real to us. Those rectimers trying to identify honeypots beforehand not make it more difficult for them. So running it from a Windows box, you could do this. Uh, then you could also do, uh, I think it's called uh, new-smb mapping, which is like net news command, where you can map a network share. So I have a script that I wrote called netbait that it will use new SMB mapping to also spew credentials. So first, it sends out that request, broadcast multicast and resolution request. Hey, I'm looking for FSO1. Does anybody know where that is? If somebody responds, it will create an event log entry. It can also drop things in, uh, lines into a log file saying, hey, this IP address responded saying I am FSO1. Second thing you can do, if you do spew threads, it will send out a username and a password in a net NTLM patch. So the red teamer is now spending time trying to crack that. The default one I have in this is about 33 characters long. It's going to take forever to crack it. It is crackable, though. It will just take about six, seven hours if you've got something like a GTX uh, 3050 on your device. Uh, but again, it's a humbug. And you have now detected the most common thing us red teamers do in network environments. And I've been taught by this twice. And it was, I, I respected that class. You know what's in this cool? Show me how you did this. Uh, and there's some paid tools that will do it. Uh, but you don't need to do that if you've got time. Um, doesn't take much time to set this up. And then what we do with our clients is we've got this log being sent over to a sync. They will then do alerting. And this would be, once you tune it, and once you run it for a bit, and you make sure there's no false spots there, this will be a high fidelity alert. Because somebody responded to what should not have been responded to. There should not be anybody saying they are FSO1. And if somebody does respond to that, we have a bad actor. Of course, you can't talk about honeypots without talking about Canadian tokens. The website is canadiantokens.org. It's free. As an organization, I suggest using the paid, uh, paid uh, commercial appliance so you support their development. But canadiantokens.org, I use this on my personal computers. I'll create a PDF file. I will drop it on my desktop, and there will be something like tax receipts or 2023 taxes. And the way it works is it's going to have an image inside, like a tracking pixel, inside that uh, PDF. So anytime somebody opens that PDF, doesn't matter if they open this in a web browser, in a PDF viewer, <coughs> anything else, I'm going to get an alert saying, hey, somebody opened that PDF on this IP address. And you can put in some notes that tell you where you dropped it. So you could create one for your uh, HR file share, one for your IT file share, create one for maybe just your desktop, and drop it there. Um, you could also, there's quite a few different things you can do with this. You can also use it to monitor Azure AD users' uh, DNS requests to different DNS endpoints. Um, AWS keys, so you can have AWS keys sitting somewhere in a file the moment that key gets used. 
you get an email alert from Canary Token saying, hey, somebody just used that key, and here is the IP address where they came from. Um, a bonus, if you use this to monitor commands. So what the way that works is, I believe it's a scheduled task that monitors what commands were run. Um, so you could monitor things like who am I. Those are folks who became pen testers by taking OSCP. We are used to running who am I. Or those of us who did CPS, we run who am I. The first thing we do when we get in a box is we run who am I. And recently a client did that. They, they taught me because I ran who am I. So that was a fun call with them. Uh, I learned all that. Because your typical user should not be running who am I. Joe at Firmdesk has no business running who am I. Or net user. Why would they be running net user? So you're going to learn on that. And that would give you the ability to identify attackers. Somebody malicious in the environment. And even if they are not malicious, it's still worth asking them, why don't you want that? Um, they, they made that, uh, they took a class at B-Size and they wanted to test things out. It may not be a malicious thing to do, but shouldn't we really be doing that? <laughs> I mentioned KeyPass database earlier. Well, you could have your own KeyPass database that you drop in a network share. You should drop that in the IT network share. Uh, and have the password either sitting in a different folder somewhere else, or maybe the same folder. No, that might still work. Or you can just not have the password sitting anywhere and make it something that will take some time to guess. And this gives you the ability, because this is a password manager database, you could have, it could really just have like a whole story around where do you want the attacker to go. You could really control where they go next. Which applications they're going to go after? Which websites they will try to log into? They really try to waste their time with this. Um, oh, one note. Yeah, so <laughs> one note is way too often used by IT teams to store credentials. Um, and I think, I think this is a zero day I'm going to drop right now. One note is not a secure note application, okay? <laughs> Don't put notes in one note, please. Although, my favorite use of one note is malware transfer. If you have access to the client environment or RDP and they have one note, open up that one note in a web browser on your, your box, upload malware to it as an attachment in one note, and download it on the target's place. Um, that's, that's often the fun way to do it. But yeah, OneNote is used quite often by IT teams. So maybe you have a OneNote notebook that is an IT OneNote notebook and it happens to have network diagrams. It happens to have some documentation about some vendors, maybe the last pen test report, and maybe it has some credentials in it. But maybe some of it or all of it happens to be fake. Waste my time. The, the activities that IT is performing daily that we are used to, the attackers are used to, the users, the activities they are doing every day that we, the attackers, are used to, use those against us. And you're spending so much time trying to change the user behavior. And this taking time, and some of it is being successful, some of it is taking time. Well, maybe we use that user behavior uh, in, in a way that wastes the attacker's time. Because we know the attacker is going after that behavior. So this script uh, is part of Empire C2 framework, but you could do it in many different ways. One of the very common things we'll do as attackers, as teamers, is we will dump SEN, we will dump it to yes, or wherever we can find some NT hashes. We'll take those hashes and we'll pass them to other boxes. These are the NT hashes that come out of SEN and NTDS. What if you had same ones sitting in LSS? So you can do that. Uh, this script uses a Win32 API to perform that operation. Another way to do this is you just create an actual user. You have that user log on to another box. And then after that user's logged on to the box, you just change the password. That hash in there is no longer valid. And if somebody tries to log on with that hash, you know there's somebody who's malicious in the environment. The trick is the user has to be real. If the user is not real, then you may end up giving away that trick. 
But also, don't just use one hundred pot. I used a went through a lot of techniques in the end. CanadianTokens.org itself has 10, 15 different things you can do. So I've had uh, red team engagements where the client had 10, 15 different Honeypot users. They had four to five service principal names that have a Honeypot. They had these PDF files dropped in all kinds of shares. Uh, earlier, there was a talk in here, the panel about inside the threat. Well, you can do this to, find, to grab the, uh, to identify inside the threat. You know, drop that PDF file. Call it something like 2024 acquisition plan. And put that in a busy network share, see who opens it. Um, call it uh, CEO monthly salary or whatever. And put that in a network share, see who opens it. You will find that inside the threat because quite often the inside the threat is not somebody who's intentionally malicious. They're just curious. And their curiosity causes some sort of an incident. Or they got duped by a threat actor somehow. Um, you know, there was one case where the threat actors paid somebody a lot of money to click on a link. And you get that money in your bank account and you tell security team, oh, sorry, I didn't think that was a phishing email. But you end up making uh, money out of that. So yeah, use this to find your inside the threat too. Um, my idea I don't, don't have on this, and it's a really stupid idea. Okay. But really good idea at the same time. Uh, one of my clients, we were doing a purple team, and and they ended the purple team. We just started shooting some ideas, and they mentioned, "What if we had hundreds of users, that were Honeypot users, and we had hundreds of Honeypot groups? Those hundreds of users were members of those hundreds of groups in nested group memberships, where those hundreds of groups were also members of some other hundreds of groups." And those hundreds of groups, they had permission from some other hundreds of users. And they all had the ability to local admin on maybe 5, 10, 15 different boxes. Uh, and I think that's a pretty crazy idea, but it's a really good idea. Because imagine running blood humming as that environment. It will take forever. And I'm going to get really excited. And then I have hundreds of different paths to verify. And maybe one of them is true, but hundreds of them are not. So, hey, if anybody wants to take it, do it, run it, put it on GitHub, because we're not to test that out. But yeah, I mean, do, do something like that. Do something really crazy. Face uh, our time. Because Bloodhound is a, a very common way we are finding those paths. Okay? And when we do that, and you've got hundreds of fake users, hundreds of fake groups, hundreds of fake permissions, you have waste a lot of my time. And that's a good thing. It's a really good thing. So, you have one, hey, 12 sponsors. Um, Besides our uh, very important sponsors is like conscious cyber security. Um, and uh, I got my start in, in B-Sides, so, you know, thank you sponsors for, for doing what you did. And that's me. Um, the talk, the slides are going to be here. Uh, hashtag info next slash uh, uh, contacts. And that's on LinkedIn. Anybody wants to connect from there, please do let me know uh, who you are. We got a lot of stand there too. Any questions? We have some time. Yeah. Mm. Can I ask you what if you could uh, I love the title some of those rules that you built to detect blood count? Um, Okay. So, uh, looking at the cost. Mm -hmm. device and uh, the other one is just uh, uh, maps, 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 and second one is if somebody is going through many, many devices and doing some activities there or reverting them. So we have had some clients detect blood hounds. So when I'm doing a true red team engagement, but I'm not, but I am being stealthy, I'm not going to run blood hound. Because blood hound will be a bad idea there. There, what I use is you go file the IRL RDP to a device if I can, I'll pull up File Explorer, go to Network tab, and there's an AD search that you can do. That is coming from AD, or I will go to Outlook if I have somebody's inbox access. And I will look at 
uh, Outlook address book. It doesn't give me the same info as Bloodhound Go, but it gives me that a bit more info about the environment. So oftentimes we have admin users that name is admin something. But I've had clients kept me by running Bloodhound, but not a lot. I wish it was more. Bloodhound is such a loud tool. It is going to the main controller saying, hey, give me all of your computers, <coughs> all users, all group policies, who has bought access, and then it takes all those computers, goes to each one of those computers, hey, give me all of your users, give me all of your local admins, give me all the policies applied to you. So it is a really loud activity happening in the network. But we're not seeing a lot of people with that being. I'm usually really your typical ABs would catch that. But the, the biggest problem is, is they have to get through a whole lot of then If you can search what's been your total, you search which AB they have. You can actually really get the AV. Yeah, so EDR, AVs are catching when you're on Bloodhound, the shot on executable specifically on the host. But what if you ran Bloodhound up PY from a Linux box? You don't have anything touching the disk. So then you need something like a sim to know there's many requests coming. Uh, to to your uh BC. Has it still catching? It's like ours got talk a lot because we already plug everything in each other. But do you use the Python script? Yes, we actually use it so different. Nice just to see if it would catch it. So we we were actually using uh, several different techniques. And mm -hmm. I can't exactly say yeah. which two, but it was one of the major players. But uh one of the ransomware games actually searches out specific uh, tools like the top tier ones like uh, 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 trends. Uh -huh. uh, you said trend was on the top ones? Uh, well, I'm just messing with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like top 10, I was thinking. It's not good one. Nobody, anybody give them trend? They're not a slide though, are they? No. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think Palo Alto is one of them. Yes, with Cortex. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, that's what they did. And actually, I was working at a company that, that's how they attacked us. But they didn't look for the specific service that we were using here. And that's how we actually got it. With our uh, past, I think it got detected once. The client was running Elastic's uh, Endgame. Um, and it has, so a lot of those EDRs will have some sort of a SIM component to them. So this one, what it was doing was, you got a ticket from host A that is being used in host B. That doesn't make any sense. And that's how they got the alert that it was the environment. So we got caught. So we didn't get any alerts for like or anything like that. It was when they wanted to install the scanner tool. Yeah. So, what kind of advice tips do you have for smaller rigs? Like, what's the vibe on the slide? Um, to start in kind of conversations. I'm not able. I'm a little excited for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, smaller. I don't think that's time your question first. So, you're saying what's my advice for people for smaller red teams, less than five people old? In what sense? Um, to start like having these kinds of conversations oh, about only thoughts like with their really teams. Yes. Well, first step in that is don't disappear. So that that's a difficult part, right? Because sales team is always hounding me, hey, why are you spending so much time with that client that's not available? And, and that's where smaller red teams have the trouble is you have to sort of manage your time and not spend too much extra time with the client because you've got another client waiting for you. Um, I would say take pride in your reporting and in that report, talk about the positive measures, the good thing they did. If they did deploy a honeypot, give them a kudos on that. Put that right in the executive summary. That, hey, you had a honeypot that detected us. That's a great job. That will encourage them to do that more often. Um, talk about some of this in your attack interface, in your recommendations. In the recommendations you write, don't just focus on fixing this problem today. Think about the future. So don't just say, change the default password on this one device. Say something like, uh, ensure that all defaults are changed before going to production. Implement a secure configuration standard, something like that. Think of the future in your reporting, and that might help with that. Second thing would be to um, maybe do some sort of a CTF with them every now and then. 
maybe if you're a small team, you probably won't have a lot of time. Maybe it's once a quarter. You do something on um, uh, try happy with them. That might help. You'll notice a lot of blue teamers, they eventually want to get to the red team. Right? So use that to help them get back. What else? Uh, and then you're seeing group managed service accounts being used to all Yeah, so yes and not enough. So group managed service accounts, so I'm going to talk about forever roasting, where you have a service principal name for an account. And because it has a service principal name, anybody can request a service ticket to back it offline. Okay, that's one issue with it. Second issue with service principal names is if you put a username and a password in service manager, that password is stored in plain text in memory. So anybody with local admin access can dump access and see that password. So group managed service accounts is what we generally recommend because group managed service accounts, you can tell where they should log on from. You don't have a password that you set, the computer sets it. And that is a very strong password, I'm not guessing that. Uh, three, they cannot be turbo roasted. So that is, uh, my recommendation, our recommendation, get rid of service accounts, go to my service accounts. Problem is, GMSs don't play well with Linux and with any Unix or Linux type devices. So that creates a limitation. Secondly, the, a lot of times organizations have a service account that is being used on 50 devices, and it's all hard coded those 50 devices. So when you ask them to use GMSA, they start worrying, how am I going to go to those 50 devices and put in the new account in them? And that sort of that limitation they have is how do I go to those 50 devices and change the password leaves them vulnerable for it. But GMS is a lot that you mentioned it because that's really important. Use that. Uh, one more question. And we're done. Anything else? Yep. Uh, from like a blue team side, how do we talk to leadership to say, you know, honey pots are good because we're paying for a pen test and they want to see results, but then they go, oh, you know, we paid for them to waste 30 hours <laughs> and we didn't get any results out of that 30 hours. So how do we like bridge that conversation with them? That's a good question. So you paid the pen tester to come in and destroy you. you paid the pen tester to come in and find vulnerabilities, but now you are wasting their 30 hours, 40 hours. <laughs> you know, um, what I would suggest is once you find there are a honeypot, don't just let them come that out. Maybe waste like half an hour and then let them know it was a honeypot. And make sure they put that in the report. Make them put that in the report. Us red teamers, we need to start giving blue team some credit. Okay? Uh, when blue team detects you, talk about them in the report. What we'll generally do is we'll ask the client blue team to send us a screenshot of that alert and we'll put down the report. Uh, the executive summary will talk about how this was an authorized assumed breach. Uh, like one we did very recently, the client gave us a domain admin credential. Uh, so we talked about that in the report. Hey, this was an authorized assumed breach where the client gave us a domain admin for reasons X, Y, and Z. So the one reading the report doesn't think that it's just terrible. And I mentioned earlier, put positive measures in there too. Uh, so yeah, don't, if, if you, uh, if this is one of those engagements where it is a pen test and not a true red team and you are um, worried about wasting too much time, just let them know that you caught them. Maybe don't tell them what the other honey pots. <laughs> tell them, hey, this one just tripped about half an hour ago, just let you know, and then let them do the thing. Okay, thank you. No? All right, folks. Really appreciate your time. As I mentioned, slide next uh, uh, is right there on that uh, link. And I'll be around if you all have any questions. Thanks.